and the founder of the National Animal Interest Alliance, recipient of Dogdom's Woman of the Year, past board member of the AKC. Please welcome Patty Strand. Thank you. Thank you, Maribeth. It's really nice to be with you. I love breeders, love dog breeders, and I'm especially honored to be on a panel with the, the people that I am. These people are really masters of, of this art. Um, I also love being a breeder. As Maribeth said, I've been breeding dogs for actually almost 45 years now. It's a, it's a long time, and um, it just seems like it, it never grows old. There's always something new to learn from the process. And um, I guess if I had to do my life all over again, I'd do it exactly the same. That, that's about it. Um, just start here with a few of our dogs. That was our founding sire, and that was our top winning dog. And we have some agility dogs. And this is just to show you that I still am a breeder. <laughs> so when I first started to organize my thinking about putting this uh, program together, I thought that I would do puppy packets. I would put together the most perfect puppy packet that you could ever ask for. And I went out on the internet to gather information about, about puppy packets and I found that there were hundreds and hundreds of them and that most parent clubs have really good examples of them and probably, I got to thinking, probably all of you have a good puppy packet too. So instead of talking about that, I downloaded one really good puppy packet. If you want information on it, it's over by the door when you leave. And I decided that I would talk about something that I think is a little bit more relevant to this group right now. And that is, um, we are, I think without question, the best source of purebred dogs that the American public has. And I think that based not only on knowing you and knowing how much effort and dedication you put into what you do, but there's also scientific studies that demonstrate that dogs that come from us have better outcomes in terms of they stay in the home that they're placed in rather than winding up in multiple homes over, over a period of time. Laura, uh, you get an awful lot of repeat buyers coming back to you. That tells you a lot too. I know in a recent litter that I sold, every puppy but one was to somebody who had bought a puppy um, ago or 12 years ago and 24 years ago and th one of them had this was their fourth fourth dog from us they literally bought their first dog from us in the 70s and I think that our experience is pretty common actually for people in this group your puppy buyers come back to you um, another thing uh, that made me think I should maybe change direction a little bit was that um, we I think we all recognize that we have a shrinking pool of serious dog breeders in the fancy there aren't as many of our dogs out in the American public as, as there used to be. And we are not, therefore, as prominent with the general public as we used to be. And this is a little graph that I made a while ago. It is the top 10 dogs in the AKC registry from 1998 to 2012. And I think that the uh, trend line is, is pretty revealing and, and pretty, pretty horrifying, really. There's only one breed that you can see that's actually going up there. Um, so there's a lot of challenges that are, are facing us. Uh, I think urbanization with the loss of hands-on animal experience that people have in general has made them sort of subject to believing anything from anybody and uh, to help them have all kinds of crazy ideas that aren't accurate. We have also this huge growth in mass marketing, mass media, and the internet, of course, where anybody can say anything, and we all know that everything we read on the internet is true. But in a society where people don't have this hands-on experience anymore, it's a really serious problem for us. And so I went out on the internet just to see what I could find in terms of if I put in dog breeders in Portland, Oregon, to see what the prominent uh, things would come up. And I found, number one, fabulous websites for Labradoodles, and in fact, just about every kind of doodle. But the first, I don't know, 12, 15 hits were not us, okay? And then another um, website that came up, and this is for commercial breeders. Um, they're organized. They have something on the web, the breedersclub.net. And then, of course, um, our local Humane Society is marketing dogs like crazy. They import about 3,000 a year so that they'll have dogs available to sell to the public, or they call it an adoption. But for $500, I think it is a sale, no matter what the name of it is. Um, so I got to thinking, um, 
maybe, maybe Americans might be a little bit confused about where they should get their next dog. And with this other group that I'm associated with, NAIA, we did an, a national survey to just, we asked like 58 kind of important questions. And, and uh, one of the sets of questions asked about what was most important to buyers. And the two most important things were temperament and health, like you'd guess. And then we followed through with a question and said, if temperament is your most important issue, where would you get your next puppy? And, excuse me, I'll go back for just a second. That's the study. It was 1,000 people, confidence level, 95%, margin of error, 3.3. So it's a good study we did, very randomized too. So then we said, assuming that temperament is a high priority in your decision making, where would you look first to find your next dog? And we were pretty surprised with this answer. Uh, only 17.2% thought that they'd go to an in-home hobby breeder that belongs to clubs and goes to dog shows, while 33% said that they would get their best-tempered dog from a shelter. And that's just horrifying. I mean, I think everybody in this room, is there anybody in this room that really thinks that, that they got it right? I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I think that we know that we are breeding and raising dogs the best, especially after you hear Anne, all the different things she's doing. Same thing with health. In fact, it was a little more disappointing. 16.5% uh, would buy from us or look, look for a dog from us first, 34% from a shelter. This is for health, and this is our community is the one that's funding all the research for canine health. We're the ones that do all the testing. We're the ones that care, and nobody knows it. Okay, so change the direction a little bit of my talk and um, said, okay, what do we need to do? Well, as a community, again, thinking of the core, we need to increase our public presence and um, so that the public can find us because that's a big problem they have. There was another question on the test, by the way, where we or the survey where we asked people um, if they had had difficulty or if it had been impossible for them to find the dog of their choice so any time during the last five years. And that came in at 9%. And more than half of those people gave up altogether, by the way. So that, that was kind of interesting. And then uh, once people find us, we have to engage them in a way that raises our image with the public. And just one of the first things I'd mention is just really simple, is that you should have a website Okay, everybody who's a serious breeder should have a website. You don't necessarily have a website to sell puppies. You have a website so that people can find a good Doberman pincher breeder or expert to talk to or a good uh, Welsh Terrier breeder to talk to. You don't have to have a website just to sell puppies. And then I told my husband when I put this together, when I list Craig's list there and eBay and national magazines that, that the audience would all reach behind them and find a tomato to throw at me because these are not very popular places with hobby breeders. But the fact is, most of these places, um, they all advertise puppies, but we're not there in any form. You don't have to advertise your puppies there, but there should be some kind of a generic ad about buying from a responsible breeder. There should be something there from your parent club, from your own regional clubs, because right now the general public that isn't as educated as you, they go to these places and we're not there at all. So put your tomatoes away. <laughs> Okay, so you can put a generic ad in that just says something like, looking for a healthy, well-bred Doberman, pincher, get the best. And, and it can be your breeder referral person that it goes to in your club or somebody else in your club that likes to talk to the public. But we need to be present in these places, and we are not now. Um, and again, even if you don't have puppies to sell, what's really important is that your ex you are the experts, and if you can't be found, your expertise will be lost. And it's just very personally frustrating to me to hear people quote their Labradoodle breeder, and usually things that aren't quite accurate, and represent them as expertise about dog breeding and so on. So you need to be represented. You need to have your expertise put forward in some way or another. And it isn't just the public, the dog buying public and your, your neighbors and so on that, that need to know your experts. Politicians also need to know that because they likewise will be relying on people other than you if you don't put yourself out there and get yourselves identified as the experts. Okay, so back to this graph again. I didn't want to leave you depressed. Um, 
I wanted to just share with you that the breed that's going up is bulldogs, and they have a lot of public presence. They're in tons of commercials and so on. And so public presence really does matter. And then there's one other breed that was falling along with the others, and then it levels out right there in the middle, and that is the German Shepherd Club. And they began to do some proactive things within their club to encourage people to register. So you can turn this around, but you have to understand it's a real problem, and you have to take action. You have to begin to do things to, to solve this. Okay, so to be a mentor is to be a role model or to be an educator or just someone who influences. And the particular things I decided I wanted to talk to you about was um, mentor people to raise the appreciation of your special knowledge, that expertise you have that's called husbandry. Or in modern lingo, the canine human bond is what a lot of people call it. Uh, mentor newcomers to respect the culture and the sport. When people look at us running around the rings at a dog show, they can't quite figure out what we're doing. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think they can watch agility and see everybody's having fun. But we look, we're a little odd to look at from the outside world. So uh, we want to mentor people to understand and respect our culture and the sport. We want to mentor them to protect and promote purebreds. And we want to mentor newcomers to the sport to understand that we're all volunteers and it's our job to give back to the sport. Okay, so as role model, um, I almost didn't put this slide in because it's so simplistic and everything. I thought, well, maybe I don't really need to put that in. But treat people like you want to be treated. Be nice, okay? That should go without saying, but um, one of the experiences that I've had pretty often over the last um, decade or so, especially when I was on the AKC board, was first of all getting complaints that people had called people associated with, let's say, a parent club and never gotten a call back week after week after week, or they called a referral number, a number that some club put out there uh, publicly, this is the place to call, and they either didn't get a call back or the people were rude to them, or they acted like, why do you want a dog? Why, you know, I mean, are you really fit to have a... In other words, um, I think sometimes our pro-responsible dog ownership message gets kind of blurred and we just simply sound rude. So be nice, okay? That, that would be a good thing. Um, always act with integrity, do the right thing for the right reason, and then really share your expertise with everyone. Learn to talk about these things that you know how to do, that you know how to do better than other people. I mean, I'm just so impressed when I listen to Anne, and uh, actually I got, I got to hear everybody else earlier this morning too, so I know it's coming. But we, we are the experts in husbandry, and her talking about bottle feeding her babies when they're a few hours old and uh, cuddling them to her neck and somebody else talking about nibbling them too and training them and grooming them. We are the experts. You're the, you're the people who know how to do it best, but are you communicating to the, this to the public that you are? And I would just say that uh, husbandry is, it is, the lost art of husbandry is a very sexy thing to the young up-and-coming generations with a lot of the news uh, some of the programs from National Geographic about the evolution of the canine-human bond. Uh, this stuff is very, very interesting to young people. I know I have a son who's in his 30s that's really young to me. He's 39, actually. So uh, anyway, um, but when he and his friends come around or I just, you know, am uh, privy to other young people talking, this is a really interesting area for them. Because one of the things that the programs are talking about is the fact that the reason that the Neanderthal died out and the later hominids survived was, guess what, they find bones of canines in, in proximity to these burial grounds where they understand that they were working together and that that might have been the big difference. So that's kind of exciting stuff. And that is what we're engaged in. Certainly I just have a definition for you there. I think you all know that it is um, selectively breeding and raising animals to promote desirable traits. And then here are just some of the things, you know, if you're watching National Geographic and paying attention, this is a cave wall, and unfortunately the lighting is a little bad here, but you can see a dog down in the left-hand corner. And then, of course, there's art throughout the ages, and I always tend to find a spotted dog if I can to show you. <laughs> just can't help myself. But this is the later version here. This is the modern version as it continues today. Okay, mentor newcomers to respect the culture and the sport. What we're doing is really important. It's really valuable. And this is a little ad that, that we put together, another group I'm associated with. But um, 
what's really cool about this is it's true. George Washington <laughs> founded the American Foxhound. He was a very serious breeder. When you read his diaries, they're just utterly fascinating. And I was able to find in his diaries that he imported a, a little French bitch, a Dalmatian too. So I was able to include the picture of my breed in the uh, ad. Benjamin Franklin likewise had Dalmatians. And if you read through not only the founding fathers, but the presidents up to the modern age, I think there's only one or two that didn't have a purebred dog. So it's kind of ripe for us to be able to, if we're trying to uh, sort of reassert ourselves and our expertise, we can rely on some of this stuff. And this was uh, the first dog that was pictured in what is kind of like a modern breed standard. This was in England, 1865. That was just dug out recently in the last few months. Somebody found that. And here's a handbill from Westminster, 1877. And this is how they were showing dogs back there. It's pretty, pretty interesting, I think, to most people. I mean, the bottom line is our sport didn't just start yesterday. This is not something that any of the other groups that are out there producing dogs can, can say. And this, again, modern era, this is where we are now. And then AKC, of course, you've got to learn every wonderful thing AKC does so you can spiel it off when you're in an el you know, the old elevator speech. You need to be able to tell everybody that the American Kennel Club has spent more than $24 million funding canine health research, done 45,000 kennel inspections, reunited thousands and thousands of dogs through their, um, they've changed AKC cars, now AKC Unite. Um, and then also that they've donated lots of money to search and rescue. And that when there is a, some kind of national disaster, AKC is there. So we're more than just dog shows, too. We, we are huge contributors to the world of dogs. Lots of books and stuff that you can also tell them about. And you want to mentor them to promote um, and protect purebred dogs and the sport. Um, number one way to do that is to, when you have puppy buyers, bring them into the sport. Um, not everybody that you sell a dog to is going to want to go to a, a confirmation dog show, nor is every dog you sell capable of doing that, but they can at least go to a barn hunt. And I will tell you that uh, during the years I was on the AKC board, I, I just wasn't as involved in, in really thinking about these things like I should, and I just pretty much I sold dogs to the, you know, people came, and if they were the proper person for the dog, I didn't think about bringing them into the sport. Now lately, every litter I have, I, in, I tell people about the sport, and in my last litter, I got them to participate. I'll have three that go into confirmation, one that will do something agility, and another one that's going to do barn hunts. So your, your buyers are prepared to do these things, and it's a wonderful way to introduce people to the sport. And again, some of the prejudice against what we do is that they don't know the wide range of the wonderful things we do. They just see us running around a show ring only. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is to invite people who are interested in your breed to uh, come to club meetings. I'm not saying to invite them into membership right away, but if you have open meetings and different kinds of meetups, you know, try to bring people in, get them interested. And then with your puppy buyers, be sure you cre create some kind of online database for yourself so you're able to reach them real easily rather than having to flutter through a stack of papers this deep. And you'll be able to keep in contact with them, invite them to different kinds of events, and maybe even rally them for a piece of legislation that you want them to be active on. Uh, mentor newcomers to give back to the sport. And this is just my personal thing I wanted to put in here because I do, like a lot of you, put on dog shows. A lot of work goes into dog shows. Sometimes months and months of work goes into dog shows. And sometimes you meet people at the dog shows that don't seem to understand that those of us at the dog show are putting on the dog show. <laughs> we are volunteers. It's not like anybody's making money on this. We do it for our friends. Basically, are throwing a party for our friends. And there isn't another sport like this in the country. Your job is to be part of it. And part of sportsmanship is giving back and letting other people know that um, they need to, to work to put on dog shows and events for people too. Uh, mentor newcomers to understand that the sport of dogs would not exist without volunteers. Just absolutely crucial. Think of any other event where there's 5,000 clubs here. Each one of them is run by somebody who's willing to do this absolutely for free just because of the love of what they do. Okay, and then this is my second topic, and I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm going as fast as I can. Let's see. Oh, I'm okay. I'm all right. Very good. 
Um, again, this is a topic you could spend an entire workshop. You could spend all day on this. I'm just going to hit a few uh, a few points on it. Uh, what is a stud dog? Well, um, you have dogs that are at open stud. When I started in 1969, pretty much everybody who had a dog finish a championship had it at public stud. People would find out that so-and-so had a champion this or that, and that dog was just generally available to the public. Sometime in the, about the late 70s, the beginning of the 80s, the idea of the open stud dog pretty much vanished. And for people in the organized dog world, uh, they moved on to the second category there. Dogs were available to members of their parent club or local regional clubs, basically people who had the same values and maybe had adhered to the same code of ethics or people that you would think would, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, by private treaty, where you have a situation where somebody doesn't want to have a dog at public, doesn't even want to have a dog um, available to most people, but very, very selectively for one reason or another. Uh, good dog management, I think, uh, I think we're going to be talking about... Um, this in deeper terms a little bit later, but basically uh, to be, to manage a stud dog well, you have to have the experience, the wisdom, and the integrity necessary basically to know what you have, to be able to discern whether the dog you have is really breed progressive. And to be breed progressive, um, being breed progressive means more than just having all of the health clearances that are necessary for your breed or even five or six extra health clearances. Um, there are a lot of mediocre dogs out there that can also have health clearances. The health clearances are good. All of my dogs have them. I advocate them. But it is more than having sim simply having the health clearances. It means uh, that the overall quality of the dog, when it's compared to the history of your breed and also your breed as you find it today, is good. It's solid. You have those health clearances too. But more than that, you, your dog has something to give away. It has something that is valuable and perhaps um, hard to find in the breed at a particular point in time, or just so excellent it stands out, in addition to being that good basic, basic dog. Maybe the best head the breed's ever seen, or maybe it has a front assembly in a breed that has a, a problem with shoulders and front ends. Maybe it has the best front that has come along in many, many years, and it has other attributes that go with it. And of course, what, um, what is a good stud dog for today really does depend to a degree on what's in the ring right now, right? I'm a, I'm a nut on feet. Dalmatians have to have good running gear. And I, I just have to tell you, if anybody has a Dalmatian in here, and I don't think you do, don't ever bring me flat feet. I just can't do it. <laughs> I just really have a problem with them. Um, but if you had a dog and his feet were a little bit flat and you were in a breed where everybody else's foot was really good, that wouldn't be as serious of a problem, would it, just because of the gene pool that the dog would be breeding into. So you have to look at the context. Okay, contracts. Again, just hitting some kind of light points and stuff. Um, terms of agreement include things like the fee, and that's not only, you know, the amount of money, but how it's going to be paid whether it's going to be pay, paid up front, whether there'll be some kind of terms. But getting all that in writing is really, really important because you can find yourself at registration time with no stud service and the owner of the bitch arguing with AKC that you must sign the papers because it was, you know, it can be real messy. And I can tell you that from being on the AKC board for 16 years. So you want to make sure that both parties are really clear on what's expected of each of them. And um, if there are going to be boarding fees, um, in the early days, of, I've always had a sire line of production, and in the early days, I used to be really excited that somebody was going to send me their beautiful, great bitch that just won the national or whatever, and I wouldn't bother to tell them that they shouldn't leave her with me all winter. And so, <laughs> and so it's a good idea to add that there will be no boarding fee if you keep, if it's only seven days, for instance. Just helps everybody understand that that there's some kind of manners and attention to, to comfort and things like that that you have to take into consideration. Um, if the terms are breached, who is responsible? You've got to itemize those things. What constitutes a litter? Is it two puppies? Is it two healthy puppies? Is it two puppies that are healthy and have no disqualification? You have to spell those things out. And what happens if, if there's no litter? Will you do a return service? 
And um, just how are those things going to be arranged? And by the way, I did bring some contracts with me too uh, that have a lot more detail if somebody is interested. But I would also tell you that just like the puppy packets, they're all over the internet, so you can probably find better ones, you know, than even I brought. Okay, and then this is just contracts continued. This is responsibilities of the parties. Obviously, um, it's very, very important, one of the most critical things for a stud dog owner and, and for anybody that is going to be using an outside stud is to make sure, both parties need to make sure that their uh, animals are very, very healthy, that they're up to date on all their vaccinations, that they've had a recent brucellosis test. And of course, there are other kinds of things out there. If, as a stud dog owner, you might want to find out whether the bitch conceived at her last litter or not and ask some further questions. Um, bitch owners pledge that they will keep the bitch confined afterwards. I think that's standard in just about all the contracts. And then um, if they're going to, we have frozen semen from a number of our different sires at our house that we use. A lot of the dogs are, we have frozen semen that's 22 years old and, you know, it's very, very valuable. And um, up until a few years ago, I wasn't as careful as I should about requiring the owner of the bitch to have all the progesterone testing done, having it done by a very good reproductive veterinarian and giving that information to me because the stud fee compared to the loss of the last vial of semen that's 22 years old, I mean, it's, you really need to make sure that all of that is very, very well clarified and that everybody knows what their responsibilities are there too. Um, some of the stud contracts offer semen evaluation too. I, that's not common. I've seen that on about a third of them that I've looked at. And let's see what's next. So the advantages of good stud dog management and keeping stud dogs, as, as we have, uh, you have the opportunity to improve the breed if you have a truly good dog. If your dog is used at stud and he's the real thing, you do have the opportunity to, to see later that it's been a positive thing for your breed. Um, you'll always know what's happening in your breed. You get to find out, you know, kind of where all the bones are buried as far as genetics within your breed, too, um, when you are breeding to all different bloodlines. You have the opportunity to select dogs from some of the best uh, females in your breed. And also you have the opportunity to select for similar phenotypes from diverse bloodlines. And that can be important if you have a very, very tightly line bred line like we have had over the years. I love having some new blood come in, dogs that look good and uh, carry the traits I want. And then in addition, you will earn respect if you do it right. Uh, the challenge is, of course, being honest with yourself and with the people that you work with about um, your dog, everything about your dog and his uh, potential contribution. Um, and the biggest thing, I think, for a stud dog owner bringing bitches in, you have to really be careful that you don't bring in some kind of disease. There are all kinds of, it isn't just uh, brucellosis. There are things out there that can make your dog sterile forever that... Um, you know, so you have to be careful, ask the right kinds of questions of bitches. That's why I said earlier, it's important to find out if the last time they bred the bitch, she conceived. Um, and then this is just my closing slide. This is to tell you it all goes back to the genes. But the genes I'm showing you here are people. This is a, the human chromosomes. And uh, it doesn't matter how good your dogs are. It really, at the end of the day, obviously you're going to breed for the best dogs you possibly can, but you have to work with good people, like-minded people, people who are also breed progressive, honest, all those different things, or if things won't work out the way that you want them to. And so there I have my integrity gene, my wisdom gene, and my kindness gene. And that's it. So thank you very much.